changing directions a little bit. We're going to, from to traumatic brain injury to traumatic spinal cord injury. And as you know, the project for many years has been looking at various ways in which we can enhance recovery in subacute and chronic spinal cord injured uh, subjects with uh, stem cells, as well as uh, autologous Schwann cells. And today, um, Dr. James Guest, who's a professor in the Department of Neurological Surgery and a very important uh, member of the My Project, is going to be talking to us about work that he and his colleagues have been doing in terms of neurophysiological insights into looking at uh, circuit plasticity and, and connectivity after uh, spinal cord injury. So, Jim, thanks for being here today. Thanks, everybody. I just want to uh, check that you can hear me okay. Yes. All right, thank you. All right. Again, can everybody see the slide well? Yeah, but we can see the the, um, the other. Can you? It's not in presenters mode. Can you swap on the top left? Swap display. Okay. Okay. Now you're ready to go, doctor. Okay, thank you for that. Okay, so, yeah. So today I'm going to talk about uh, a neurophysiological study uh, that we did in combination with a human clinical trial of cell transplantation and spinal cord injury. Uh, we published the index paper for this uh, study in 2017 uh, in the Journal of Neurotrauma. And uh, I wanted to talk about the concepts that I'd like to go over today. So the first is, what might we expect the effects of Schwann cell transplantation to be in complete thoracic spinal cord injury? Because the particular study this morning enrolled people who were paraplegic uh, Asia A, motor and sensory complete. I'm going to talk a little bit about the limitations of evoked motor and sensory potentials as compared to electromyography. I'm going to tell you that uh, the thoracic level that we all sort of think about, which is based on the sensory exam, is an illusion with respect to what is really going on neurologically. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the implications of what we've learned from epidural and transcutaneous neuromodulation in people with motor sensory complete SCI. So this morning we're focusing on people who have a complete uh, thoracic uh, injury. And so briefly, this is what our, our trial uh, looked like. We enrolled six subjects. They underwent a nerve harvest and there's their own cells uh, were grown in culture and then at, a, at an average of 42 days post SCI, uh, all the baseline studies that included neurophysiology were done and they went forward into the transplant if they were still neurologically complete, which meant that baseline, they didn't have any evoked potentials. And then we uh, brought them back and did assessments at two, six and 12 months. So, Going back a little bit, what, what was this trial about? So you can see here on the bottom right that this was a truly, <laughs> you don't want to call it invasive, um, spinal cord injury uh, biologic uh, trial. These cells were delivered right into the injury epicenter. And uh, I want to talk a little bit about what we expected that these cells might do. So I'm going to show you a couple of slides of primate data where we made uh, demyelinating injuries. And so here you can see a lot of demyelinated axons in a transmission electron micrograph. You see some acute uh, inflammation by macrophages, which are going to take up the debris. This is myelin debris over here. And then at a year uh, after injury, you see two different patterns. One is that there's some persisting demyelination and then the other is that there's been endogenous uh, remyelination and you see these small uh, myelin rings here. Now, what does the transplant look like? So Schwann cell transplants in the central nervous system are really interesting because they, like in peripheral nerves, they form fascicles 
uh, that have uh, endoneural uh, fibroblasts around them, but they also include the processes of uh, astrocytes. So these A are astrocyte processes. So there's no place in the body where this actually happens with maybe one exception. And so what you get when you put in a Schwann cell transplant is a unique tissue that doesn't, you know, has components in it uh, that we don't normally see. And it's, this is quite a favorable picture. And so now we're moving to some preclinical work we did in pig models. And so we made the transplant labeled here with a green fluorescent protein that you can see. Uh, and then this is the spinal cord injury defined by GFEP. And then uh, we use confocal microscopy to ask if the green transplanted cells uh, were doing anything. And indeed, they were right next to axons that had myelin on them, P0 myelin. So it seems very likely that the transplanted cells were actually able to form myelin. Now that's important because they've been outside of the body for weeks in cell culture, and then we're reintroducing them into a place they don't normally exist. And at least in this model, they seem to be able to form myelin. So that's one of the main things that we uh, target in spinal cord injury with Schwann cells is uh, myelin. I want to just bring up a few concepts here. So we're going to talk about people with complete injury today. And we're going to talk about the threshold of preserved function to actually see voluntary function or activity. So as you can see, this amount of preservation doesn't reach the threshold. So the idea with our graphs and our other interventions is to take this tissue and make it work better so that we can get to the point where we cross this bar of being able to perform voluntary uh, functions. Now, people have been looking over the last uh, couple of decades at the relationship between shared tissue and function. So this is from a uh, group uh, in uh, Switzerland, and they looked at tissue bridges, which is basically what is, how much tissue is spared in the dorsal and ventral part of the spinal cord. They quantified that and they looked over time, over the first year from injury. And then they came up with some uh, relationships uh, saying that these uh, tissue bridges, the size of these tissue bridges at the injury epicenter correlated with the motor score sensory score and other things. And uh, I, I think that these uh, sort of linear um, uh, regression analyses are a little too simple. I think probably when we look at the relationship between spared uh, tissue and voluntary function, it's not gonna be linear. It's gonna be exponential. There's gonna be a point where you're given a very big uh, increment in voluntary uh, function for each increment of neural preservation. So I, I think the real relationship is probably exponential. So now many of you have heard about epidural stimulation. And so we know that people who have motor sensory complete injuries uh, and are then uh, exposed to epidural stimulation, they have the ability sometimes quite quickly to move their foot, to move their hip or knee. And so what's happened there is it's, it's the same amount of spared tissue, but we've changed the state of the spinal cord. And now we've gone above the threshold to observe voluntary function. So this threshold is very much dependent on the state of the spinal cord. And so even in people with complete injuries who we normally just write off not really having rehabilitation potential, that situation can be altered. And just to mention a couple of papers that have looked at this relationship between epidural stimulation and voluntary function uh, over the last uh, decade. And there have been several independent reports 
uh, that this can occur. Another thing I wanted to talk about is that we have a very brain-centric attitude towards spinal cord function and recovery. We think a lot about the brain stem and the brain in terms of descending systems that are needed to uh, reactivate the spinal cord. But in the last decade, and actually probably the last 20 years, the focus has shifted to the spinal cord that's below the level of injury. And so what we're learning is that there's a lot of network capability in the spinal cord, even though it's separated sometimes from the brain and the brain stem. And so the question is, how, what can we get out of this residual functional uh, network? The other concept I wanted to go over is the so-called sensory level for paraplegia. So what I've done here is I've drawn just crudely, this is supposed to be the head, the body, this is the brain and the spinal cord. And the sensory level is really determined by residual um, function of the DRGs and also the ascending sensory systems. And so the definition that we come to in paraplegia is the last normal segments of where sensation can be felt. But I'm going to show you when you start looking at the motor side, this becomes very uh, limiting. So what is necessary for a movement to occur? Well, we need the motor neurons, we need the muscle, and then we have a lot of integration that occurs. And so what I'm showing here is just some of the inputs to a motor neuron, which are um, Um, inhibitory or excitatory. So what's happening here is all of these inputs influence the postsynaptic potential as to whether this motor neuron will fire or not. So it's a very complex and integrated system. But so what I'm showing here is uh, EMG obtained from a person with spinal cord injury who's having transcutaneous uh, stimulation this is what the EMG bursting uh, looks like during voluntary activity. And so you can see up here, uh, power factor for different grades of uh, voluntary contractions, eight, 15, and 20. And then this has been decoded into the spike trains that are necessary for uh, that voluntary function to occur. And what this does, it really allows us to see in a, in a kind of binary way, the orchestration of successful uh, movements. Now we're gonna talk about our clinical trial and the longitudinal neurophysiology that we did. And so the neurophysiological testing sort of fits into this sort of issue of biomarkers that may be useful after spinal cord injury sort of from a prognostic point of view, and also from a recovery uh, point of view. You know, there are, there are good things and, and not so good things about doing electrophysiological testing after spinal cord injury. You can detect intact circuits. You can, usually these are quite reproducible if you do them correct technically. You can actually profile an individual uh, as per the res residual connectivity that they have in their system, characterize recovery. And then what we hope as uh, the future unfolds is that we'll be able to show the effect of treatment. The cons, um, neurophysiology tends to oversimplify what's actually happening uh, in the nervous system. There's a lot of technical uh, variability and the evoke potentials themselves, they're just artificial signals. They're just us putting something into the nervous system and reading it out somewhere and taking advantage of the fact that there's a connection. So it isn't really telling us about normal uh, function. And the other thing is that the evoke potential tells us about a circuit. It really doesn't tell us much about the network of connectivity. So an MEP, uh, It's uh, induced, uh, in this case, 
by a, a coil with the windings that creates a very strong uh, magnetic field for a brief uh, period of time. And this causes current to flow in the brain. And then axons are activated and you descend the spinal cord. And if they make it far enough, they go out to uh, a muscle. And then muscle is an amplifier of signals. So rather small signals um, can be uh, picked up in muscle, which makes it a very nice way to assess uh, connections. So this is our study. And um, here we are at pre-transplantation in this particular subject. And this person had no um, motor hope potential at all. So here's your stimulus artifact. And then we expect to see something around here, but as you can see, we don't see anything. At two months, again, doesn't look very persuasive. At six months, we're starting to pick up our waveforms. And uh, what, what you're actually seeing here is the overlay of multiple pulses. And you can see there's a little bit of variability in what these uh, pulses look like. And that's very much to be expected during recovery from spinal cord injury. And then at a year, these are more notable. What's important here though, is that we have to use an augmentation maneuver, in this case, the Gendrasic maneuver, in order to see these potentials. And so had we not used an augmentation maneuver, we really would have been scratching our heads as to whether these small signals uh, were real or not. Another way to look at this, now what I'm showing you are control uh, motor growth potentials from the tibialis anterior uh, muscle. You can see again the stimulation artifact over here. And these are very reproducible. They look a lot like each other. And that's what we like to see. Now, if we come across to the subject, this is now a person with complete spinal cord injury who was enrolled at baseline with no motor evoke potentials, uh, who now has them. But what you can see is that they are very reproducible. This is, this is one potential after another. Um, but again, they require that reinforcement maneuver to be obvious. For example, without reinforcement, they're quite small. Now, with respect to the content, I want to draw your attention to the fact that the latency of these potentials is, is almost twice uh, the usual latency of the controls. And the other thing I want to show you is that the amplitude of these signals is extremely small uh, as compared to controls. So it's very interesting that we're able to pick up these small signals at a year. It tells us that there's a connection from the brain and brainstem into the spinal cord and muscles. Now, EMG is, is able to do more in a way than motor evoked potentials because it's a voluntary EMG that we're studying. And so that integrates additional components such as the will to move and how the motor program is, is organized. Now, you have to be careful with EMG because it can be very complicated by spasms in people with spinal cord injury and by uh, denervation uh, changes. So you need to make the parameters quite clear. So here, this is how we study EMG. Now this is the abductor hallucis muscle of the foot and um, these green bars represent signals that were given to the subject to say, start your contraction stop your contraction. So it's a voluntary contraction and they're supposed to start here. So two months, you know, we have a 20 microvolt signal and we're not, we're not sure whether that's uh, a real uh, voluntary movement or not, but at six months, it's uh, quite a bit bigger. It's 120 microvolts and it starts right away uh, when the, the signal to initiate uh, movement is given and it stops pretty much right away when the signal to stop is given. So this is what a voluntary uh, EMG uh, should look like. And indeed, uh, in this particular subject, who started the program with a complete injury and no uh, voluntary function, we were able to pick this up. 
Now it's even more remarkable because in this clinical trial, there was no evidence whatsoever of motor recovery. So what we're showing here is that sort of beneath the surface in a person in whom any kind of motor recovery was invisible, we could see an improvement using our neurophysiological tools. So in the trial, the yellow boxes indicate the positives that we found across the six subjects. And you see that most of this comes in in the abductor halysis muscle of the foot and in the tibialis muscle. And that's consistent with other reports in the literature that these tend to be the muscles in which one can most readily uh, pick up EMG and motor vote potentials after spinal cord injury. Another challenge that we wanted to take on is the so-called level. So according to the standard examination shown over here for each of the patients, you know, what's working properly is shown in green. What's questionable is shown in yellow. Questionable means that the score, it can be scored, but it's not normal. And you can see that for all the subjects, uh, we don't get really beyond T6. So now we come over to this person and we want to say, well, what's the motor level? Can we figure out the motor level on the chest? And so to approach that problem, we did intercostal uh, recordings, both of EMG and motor evoked potentials, and we did rectus abdominis recordings using needles. It would probably be better to use needles for the intercostals, but some of these subjects were enrolled rather acutely, and there's a little bit of risk when using uh, needles for intercostal recordings, so we didn't do that. This is the uh, paradigm for the intercostals. We're asking the person to initiate a deep breath at four seconds to hold it as long as they can. And so you can see the baseline activity here. Then they take a deep breath and hold it. And so that gives us the EMG activity, which we're able to quantify and determine a value for each intercostal uh, segment. So we studied controls to get at the intercostals because not much is known about this kind of testing. We're sort of in new territory here. And so we worked out what is the expected latency. And so these are three different uh, uh, control subjects. Uh, and you can see that the latency to the intercostal muscle, T5, T7, and T9, is ra rather similar uh, across these three different individuals. Uh, but the, there's more variability in the size, the amplitude of the signal. So now we're looking at these subjects, two examples for EMG. So at baseline, they all had very weak chest movements and uh, the signals were very small in the intercostals, um, perhaps because they're recovering from paraplegic injury. There's a lot of change and, and reorganization that needs to, to occur uh, for breathing. But at a year, you can see that here we have this start and stop markers. You can see that the pretty good EMG signal uh, present in the intercostal muscle. And so um, what do the motor evoke potentials look like? And so the um, motor evoke potentials are shown here. I know it looks a little busy and complicated, but what we're doing here is we're taking each level for each subject, and we're looking at reproducibility of the latency. And then this is the two, six, and 12 month uh, exams. And then we're looking at what's the amplitude of the signal. So here, you can see that across the exams, the latency was pretty reproducible, or just around 12 seconds at T5. And the amplitude went up over time, which we would more or less expect uh, in someone who's recovering from injury. There could be other biological things going on here. 
uh, in terms of this improvement. We can talk about that later. But what we can also see is that you have uh, very high amplitudes in the more uh, rostral intercostals, and then it drops significantly in terms of the amplitude. And so we think that there may be an indication of a thoracic level because of changes in the amplitude, let's say from here at T7 to T8. And also when you come up here and look at these latencies, they are quite different. So you can see that there's much more uh, range in the values than there is in the more rostral segments. And so it looks like something's happening at, by way of a transition across these uh, intercostals. So we did some statistical analysis and we compared the EMG in the intercostals to the motor evoke potentials. And we saw a, a, a difference. We thought that over time, the motor evoke potential uh, increased for the upper intercostals, but it decreased for the lower intercostals. And so that again, seems to indicate some type of transition in the chest. But when we, when we recorded the EMG output in terms of microvolts per second, we could see that it was going up over the year during the two, six and 12 month examinations. And so the way that we're thinking about this is that their ability to breathe, their ability to use their chest is improving over the course of the year, regardless of whether they have a connection from their brain or brainstem to their intercostal. And that's more or less to be expected because even in a passive way, as the diaphragm moves, there's going to be chest movements. And so we think that this difference, this is really the recovery of the chest. And this is really the innervation of the intercostals. And so the chest doesn't really require that there's a synchronous intercostal in order for breathing to occur. And we did some fairly detailed statistical analysis of these transitions that we see and so in this example, we found that the transitional uh, delay was 13 milliseconds. And so you can see that the more uh, rostral intercostal muscles have very small standard deviations, and then uh, the more distal have larger standard deviations. And so we argued that this represented a transition from uh, normal innervation of the intercostals to weaker innovation of the intercostals. And then, you know, we tried to uh, tell this story to our reviewers and they gave us a very hard time. And we spent a lot of time looking at the data and really trying to understand what might've happened. So there's different ways that you could explain this observation. So again, the observation is that below the injury, we're picking up intercostal activity that we would not expect based on the sensor level. So one possibility is that there are branches between the intercostals. So here this intercostal is sending branches to two more distal intercostal nerves. We do know that this happens, but if that happened, the latencies should be very similar across these three. And of course we were not, we were seeing more delayed latencies for more distal uh, intercostal motor neurons. And then another possibility, which we tend to like, is that a residual connection has an interneuron. And we know that breathing is organized through interneuronal systems that terminate on multiple motor neuron pools. So it's, it's not really like, for example, your arm or your leg. These uh, intercostal motor neuron pools, they have to move in synchrony in order for breathing to be uh, effective. And so one of the explanations may be that there's a poly level or poly uh, motor neuron pool innervation from uh, inner neurons 
And that's why we're seeing this distal um, motor vote potential activity. Another finding that came up with respect to the chest and trying to figure out where's the motor level was the identification of spasms in intercostal muscles. So here you see that T9 and you see five to 10 microvolts in this pink bar. At T10, we have a signal that's a thousand microvolts and it looks very unusual, artifactual. And uh, we, we think that this is what a spasm looks like in an intercostal muscle. So just to remind you what's happening here, we're recording everything at the same time. So we're recording eight, nine, 10, and the abdomen at the same time. But we're seeing that there's spasticity in this channel and some spasticity in this channel. So it may turn out that finding intercostal spasticity may tell us where this transitional area for the motor uh, pools in the chest actually is. And so I guess that'll be for another study. Now, what about the sensory side? We've been talking entirely about the motor side. So you've all heard about sensory, somatosensory about potentials and the way they work is you input square waves to a nerve, you have controls. This happens to be at the popliteal fossa. And then this is that around T12. So you put these controls in the system so that you know the signal's getting in. And so those controls, uh, are evident in our uh, injured patients. You can see the control from pop to fossa and then for the uh, T12 area, but we don't see any signal at the brain level, which would be the P37. Now in the injured people, um, they do have a normal uh, median nerve SSCP. So how can we see motor evoke potential than EMG, but nothing on the sensory side so I think that has to do with the averaging that happens with an SSCP. And so we know that um, the, a lot of axons are injured, so they're probably going to vary in their amplitude and at the time at which they arrive after the signals put into the system. So when you do averaging, they're just going to cancel out. Whereas up here in this cartoon example, they're closer together. And so the uh, averaging algorithm will be able to create uh, a waveform. So that's a, sort of our working idea about why we didn't see somatosensory evoked potentials. So this is actually the summary slide, and there's a couple more after this. But basically, what we found is it's easier to find a motor signal in the context of complete injury. Uh, neurophysiology can detect connections that are not apparent clinically. So one more time, these individuals really didn't change clinically, but the neurophysiology did change over the course of the year. So it, it picks up uh, connections that, that we cannot see with our clinical exam. And neuromodulation is teaching us that even these people with complete injury may be able to do some things when we change the state of the spinal cord using, uh, for example, epidural stimulation. Now I wanna bring up another idea here, which is that repair might occur, but not be clinically detectable. I wanna explain that a little bit. So if we go back to where we started, we were talking about um, paired neural substrate, the use of cells to improve the quality uh, of the spared neural substrate and make it work better. And then the threshold to observe voluntary activity. And uh, we have not crossed uh, that boundary yet. But again, reminding you about neuromodulation. Now you have same spared neural substrate. You have brought in the transplant. And now if you layer on top of that, um, a neuro, um, modulation entity like transcutaneous or epidural stimulation, then you do cross that threshold to observe voluntary function. So the, the idea that this spared neural substrate isn't important is being seriously challenged by new uh, information. I think that's the last slide. So basically 
what we've talked about is the wiring of the spinal cord by way of evoked potentials and EMG. A little bit about the state of the spinal cord in terms of whether it's being exposed to neuromodulation. Finally, I want to end on just this uh, topic here because the spinal cord below the injury is not working right. And so one of the emerging stories has to do with chloride uh, in these neurons. And so one of the important transporters, which is known as the KCP2, potassium chloride co-transporter, we know it's down-regulated uh, in spinal cord injury tissue. And so right now we're looking carefully at this as a possibility for chemical uh, neuromodulation. So that's it for me. I want to thank you very much for your attention and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Jim. Very nice presentation. Um, any questions from the audience? Hey, Jim, great work, Alan, uh, here. Uh, I, I just wondered if you could maybe, I, maybe right. some people in the audience don't even know what a dendrastic maneuver is. And if you could comment on that and what you think physiologically or electrophysiologically that does to the signal. Right. So um, there's a lot of theories about, so a gendrastic maneuver is something that you do to cause muscles to tighten in the, in the area of normal innervation and you, in order to increase the output of a signal below uh, the area of the injury. And so the classic one was what I showed um, the person was doing, which is taking their fingers, interlocking them and pulling apart. But you can get the same effect with neck flexion, or you can you could get it even with a biceps contraction. So you're using a sort of a trick in the nervous system to uh, use the innervated uh, muscle to increase the output in the, let's say, weakly innervated uh, muscle below. And so the classical um, idea uh, of the gendrastic maneuver was that it reduces presynaptic inhibition. And so there's a lot of uh, presynaptic, so presynaptic inhibition is going to affect how much neurotransmitter is released, for example, onto the motor neuron. So if we reduce presynaptic inhibition, we tend to get larger signals. And so there are other theories of how it works, but let's just stick with that one for the moment. Any, any other questions? I, I was gonna ask, um, so it appears that, um, you know, the way this feel is going is maybe cell therapies plus some type of neuromodulation. And you talked a lot about epidural stimulation and obviously you're involved in a deep brain stimulation pro project as well. I'm just wondering the early data on plasticity had to do with pharmacological agents in terms of, as you said, inhibiting uh, you know, some, some parts of the synapse and things of this nature. Is there a strategy by which we could um, integrate some of the pharmacological uh, strategies to try to enhance circuit plasticity and reorganization and recovery of function? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, sort of when I entered the field, there was a drug called foraminopyridine that was uh, topical uh, in, the, in the sense that it was claimed that it could increase the transmission across demyelinated segments. So I do think that, I think that the word neuromodulation is a little artificial because there are a lot of drugs that we can use that are also uh, neuromodulators and a lot of our pain medications themselves are also neuromodulators. So, um, I do, you know, we talk, we've talked in our meetings before about ways that we might be able to predict that a person would be a responder in a biologics clinical trial. And so to do that, we might want to do some of these augmentations of the nervous system, for example, transcutaneous stimulation to determine whether we can see clinically that the person has preserved connectivity. Uh, just going back to the KCT2 uh, for a minute. So what happens there is that after TBI, after spinal cord injury, after stroke, people with Rett syndrome and so on, 
they have very abnormal management of intracellular chloride. And so the result is that uh, they accumulate intracellular chloride. So now when GABA binds uh, to its receptor, the current goes outwards. Uh, instead of having a depolarizing current, they actually have it. Instead of having a hyperpolarizing current, they have a depolarizing current. So I think there, when we talk about neuromodulation, we also have to include uh, drugs that, that influence the membrane potential. Did I answer your question? That's that's good. That's good. I mean, I'm just looking for other alternatives that are that are have maybe. Uh, could um, build some synergy to some of the things we're doing. So, you know, there's a big area now in intermittent epoxia, for example, in terms of improving respiratory function. You know, these are the types of things maybe one day we'd like to uh, put on top of cell therapies or, you know, neuromodulation, those types of things. So that's, that's where I'm going with this. There's a lot of things out there that people are working on independently. And if we could put some of these things together that made um, uh, sense, it might actually uh, enhance um, circuit uh, recovery, and that's, that's where I'm getting at. Yeah, and I think it has to eventually be durable. It has to be durable. Like we can get transient effects that last for a few hours, but I think we really want to get things that last for months or years. Very good. Okay, thank you. I think any other questions from the audience? Thank you, Jim. Thanks everybody. Have a great have afternoon. Nice day. Great day. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye.